Hello and welcome to this IBSA series of podcasts on considering countries to where UK residents may wish to emigrate in light of the non-DOM changes introduced by the Conservatives and the likely tightening of these rules under the new Labour government. My name is Roy Saunders, founder and chairman of the IBSA, the International Business Structuring Association, a multidisciplinary global association of entrepreneurs and their professional advisors dedicated to sharing their expertise with each other within a great networking platform. Our current series of 15-minute podcasts will review beneficial tax regimes in Italy, Spain, Portugal, Malta, Cyprus, Switzerland, Singapore, Hong Kong, Israel and Dubai. Today, I'm joined by Jose Aguila, uh, an international tax lawyer with Squire Patent Boggs in Madrid. So, Jose, we held a, a really interesting podcast yesterday with Anna Gonsalves in Lisbon, where we discussed the abolition of the Portuguese non-habitual residence regime. Now, you and I have been talking many years now. Uh, we know that Spain has tinkered over those years with what we all know as the Beckham Rule. Uh, so perhaps you can start by discussing the Beckham Rule and where we are currently with this law. Good morning and thank you. Thank you a lot, Roy, again for the opportunity. It's always a pleasure to help out and, and collaborate with IBSA and with you personally. So yeah, thanks again for, for the question and try to get involved and try to find a ways that residency, attracting residency over here to Spain with this special tax regime. So I mean, I think one of the main points that I think it's worth noting in in also for the future benefit of the regime is that the intention of the special tax regime is not actually to attract high net worth individuals, it's always linked to an employment contract or a business development, let's put it that way. So that's where, and even though we've seen changes in Portugal and now in the UK, as you mentioned, in Spain, it has actually, let's say, increased its, its capability of the special tax regime, right? One of the opportunities that we find most interesting over the past years was the new offer for remote workers, that it's a growing trend after COVID, whereby any company that the employee decides to move to Spain can benefit from this special tax regime. And the benefits of the regime are basically two, that you're taxed on the employment income at a flat rate of 24%, up to a maximum of 600,000 euros a year, and that you're only taxed on Spanish source income. Therefore, any capital income assets that a person owns worldwide would not be taxable at all. Now, that's interesting because uh, I've just held a conversation with Walter and Rioni in Italy, and a completely different focus. They're focused on attracting high net worth individuals uh, rather than business uh, people. Uh, Anna in Portugal has explained that they're more now with the uh, abolition of the non-habitual residence regime, attracting uh, people who are in business, if you like, and uh, who can help develop the economy. So you're saying that's what Spain has always wanted and uh, it's continuing in the same way. Yes. And I mean, I'm not going to lie you to lie to you, of course, that the Beckham law is also a way that high net worth individuals could take advantage. Right. There's no limitation. There's no exclusion for the level of wealth, for the level of income. There's no like I remember some clients sometimes asking, well, can I pay a little bit or can I pay up to a third in threshold? There's no limitation. There just has to be a purpose of moving to Spain to work here, set up a business. Now, I mean, it has now you can own your own business, grow a company. It's just that you cannot become a self-employed, so-called self-employed. So that's where you have to set up a company and grow a business, which with the appropriate substance, or just be an employment under an employment contract or director relationship with the company. Most countries have tinkered with their beneficial tax regime disadvantageously for individuals, whereas I think Spain has been a bit more advantageous in terms of uh, individuals could only own 25% or less than 25% of the companies in which they worked. Now that's changed, has it? Yeah, that, that is correct. And again, as I said, this is the focus of, and, and, and I always like to stress that this is more of a political view of what you're trying to attract, right? Now, when tax rates go up to 50% across Europe and most of developed countries, obviously, it, it doesn't it doesn't seem like political appropriate that you want to help out the rich not paying taxes, right? So that's where 
the government is always focused on, no, we're trying to attract qualified employees. And that's how it was approved back in 2001, right? That we wanted to attract qualified individuals, right? So that's where they, they have the restriction that you cannot come and become a uh, director at a company that you or any related person has more than 25% ownership, right? They were trying to avoid that you come here, set up your company and become director. Since, again, we're attracting business professionals, what they came down and said, no, if you're looking to set up your own company and develop your own business, that's also fine. You can become director, set up your own company. The caveat that I raised there, because sometimes they create some confusion, people could say, well, I'm just an independent consultant. I can just set up my own company and start invoicing from, from my own company and be director. And what I say is that that's not the intention of the, of the, of the law, because that's what they'll say, no, you, the only purpose of setting up the company, it's there's no value in the company other than your own personal services. So that wouldn't work. So when we say you set up a company, it means that you have to have substance. You need an active an, a business activity. You need to have an office, an employment, or at least the intention of growing. As you know, this is a thing, that, this is a new development that was approved in 2023. So I always say that it doesn't need to be immediately, and no one starts a company with 30 people and 2 million in revenue. You can slowly be growing it, but you need to prove that that was the intention of setting up the company, not for your own personal use, but to actually set up a business activity. And the the, the law is that it's a maximum of six years, I think, that you get the exemption, or is that changed to five years? I can't remember. Correct. I mean, there's always a thing that, the, the, what the requirements that the regime had is that you had not been tax resident over the last 10 years and that you only apply the year you become resident and five more, right? So that means six. There was a proposal when these new discussions were brought into the table like two years ago that wanted to extend the regime for up to 11 years, 10 plus one. But at the end of the day, when these amendments were approved, it was again limited to the five plus one, so the six six tax years. Interestingly, that Walter was saying that the Italians have uh, had a fifteen year period because if you're moving, they want to make sure that you're actually moving for good, if you like, and that uh, it's a life a lifetime change. You know, moving residence is a big thing. Um, in the UK, we've only got a four-year exemption for foreign income under the Conservatives, uh, or at least that was what was proposed. I don't know what's going to happen with the Labour uh, Party. But six years is a fairly limited time uh, for a wholesale move. So it sounds like it's more for people who are uh, building their business and who are not necessarily planning to stay long term in, in Spain. That is correct. And as you mentioned, again, think about what was the purpose of the regime. It's attracting qualified professionals, which come and go. So they want to have, okay, we want to build great companies. So we want to have high qualified professionals come and work for Spain. The high individual, the, the professionals come and go. So um, again, and Italy also has a regime where it kind of, I think it gives you a 50%, 50% break on the employment income for a few years. I mean, you, you, the Italy does have that special regime, the one off 100,000, that's fine. But that's not the purpose of what the government is intending of doing. We want to kind of allow you to attract qu high qualified professionals to come for, to work for a few years. And then if they decide to stay in Spain, they have to be under the ordinary regime. If you started from scratch, six years might not be enough, right? Because this is not like when you're an employee, you come into employment, you come and go. But now they're trying, they put in that you can set up your own business. In six years, it might be that the company might not be profitable for three years, right? And then you end up only taking advantage of the regime for two years, right? Yeah, so no, I understand. That's, that's interesting. Um, what about visas to get into Spain and everything else? Because that's coupled with, you know, if a high net worth individual or if an employee or whatever, are the visas quite easy to get for employment? I suppose they probably are more easy than for uh, high net worths. Yes, let me put it. Well, actually, for high net worth, the easiest way has always been to do the the what they call the the non lucrative visa when you're not required to work. The problem is that visa it doesn't, doesn't allow you to work. You want to be under the Beckham law, law, you need to work. Allow you right? to work. So that's not know, under the uh, under the doable. So the the most interesting visa that we have now access is the remote working visa. Because that's straightforward, 
and doesn't require any sophisticated approval by the, the immigration authorities. Because as you might be aware, we did, we Spain does have a high unemployment rate, historically it did. So the, uh, the immigration authorities do have a restrictive view of obtaining a, a, a simple employment visa. So sometimes when you set up a salary of 30, 40, 50,000, they might deny that because in those situations you have to prove that you're finding a unique qualification in that person that you cannot find in the country. So the higher the salary is, the easier you can justify, hey, I'm bringing to, paying 200,000 to a high tech guy that I can't find in Spain. But for lower salaries, that's very difficult. That's where the remote working visa has been approved specifically to within this entrepreneur's law, which approved both the visa for remote workers and the access to the Beckham Law regime. So that's the most straightforward way to obtain that. Okay. Now, I guess because of the concentration more on uh, relatively short-term uh, employment, the effect on the property market might not be so significant as was, for example, the case in Portugal, where property prices rose significantly and the local people were really you know, up in arms against the, the fact that they couldn't afford the, the prices. In Spain, I don't think that's been the case, has it? Or, or... We've, we've also had, a, a let's say, a political discussion around that because one of the main opportunities also to come to Spain under a legal visa would be with the famous golden visa, right? Which with a minimum investment threshold, uh, you would be able to obtain that visa. And of course, I mean, everyone in Portugal used to go to that that uh, Tascais zone, so which is not that long, let's put it that way, right? Spain is kind of surrounded by coast basically. So, I mean, we didn't have that much of a concern of the prices going up, but it did create some, some uncertainty around well, whether we're triggering the market, we're pushing up the real estate market. So you might have heard that recently the government announced that it will repeal the golden visa for real estate investors. But again, which, as I mentioned, the golden visa for investment, it's for 500,000 euros on a real estate or 1 million on a financial investment or 2 million in public bonds. So what the government ad- announced is that it will restrict the golden visa for real estate investments. But eventually, if you, as I said, if a high net worth individual is looking to come here, you can still put a million euros down in a bank account and that would allow you to already benefit from the golden visa. So, I mean, I, our understanding is that this proposal was a mere political. I don't think it had that much of an impact on the real estate prices, but I guess they want we wanted to replicate that from the Portuguese and kind of take advantage politically, as I understand from our government. Those people who come in under the golden visa wouldn't be entitled to any tax exemption for foreign income. Yeah. So what I mentioned is the golden visa has the benefit that it doesn't require you to live in Spain, but it allows you to become tax resident. You can choose whether to become tax resident or not become tax resident. And then you can fa- you, it allows you to work. So you are able to come to Spain under a golden visa which is much more straightforward than getting an employment visa. So if you have a worker coming here, buying a house or putting money in an event, you have the golden visa automatically, and then you can set up your company easily, right? And there's also visas for entrepreneurs, but it requires a much more development proof of that. So the most straightforward way would be to buy a property until it's repealed, put money in a bank account, you get the golden visa, and then fall within the Beckham law setting up your own company to develop the relationship, right? Okay, well, that's interesting. Um, you say until it's repealed. How do you think the government, you know, we're all in changes of government at the moment in lots of different countries. How do you think the Spanish government is going to change laws or do you think we are fairly well stabilised on on what we've been talking about? Well, unfortunately, Spain is currently not in a political stable situation. And I'm not going to give you my personal views about the government because that's not uh, appropriate, of course. But I would say that our government is a pretty unstable now because it depends on certain minority political parties, which is a problem across Europe. So currently, there's not a lot of laws coming out. I mean, if you ask me whether right now we had elections last year, so in theory, we have three more years of government. If I would say we have a 50-50 chance that we have a new 
new government in place within the next three years, but it could be the case, as I said, that the government continues. So if you ask me, I do think the proposal of repealing the golden visa for real estate investment, that will go through if, if I would have to bet on that. But I don't think there would be any major changes within the Beckham law regime. Because again, right now we have a left party, two left parties there in the government, and they're the ones who actually approve this development for the Beckham law, which the purpose again was to develop it. That's why people ask me, well, is there a chance that they will take away the Beckham law like they did in Italy, that like they did in, in the UK or Portuguese? I would say definitely not. That's still gonna be the opportunity. And I don't see any other changes apart from that golden visa limitation that I mentioned. That's brilliant. Okay, well, thank you, Jose. It's been fascinating. I'm trying to keep these podcasts to 15 minutes. We've done really well. Um, thank you for joining me today. And thanks everybody for listening. Thanks a lot, Roy. Appreciate it. And happy to help where needed.